Well, if you turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel and your notes to that place, we'll begin. I think we just finished the uh, survey of the first book of Samuel. We come this morning to the second. We gave you the purpose for the other study, and I'd like to begin with 2 Samuel. The purpose of this book is to establish the Messianic throne, and secondly, to give the history of the reign of David. We have the establishment of the Messianic throne and the history of the reign of David. Now, I've divided the book into two parts, and it's really almost one part. David's Lamentation over Saul and Jonathan, chapter 1, which could really have been in 1 Samuel, because originally these were one book, 1st, 2nd Samuel, like 1st and 2nd Kings were one book, later were divided. But if you're going to divide them, this isn't the place to divide them. Chapter 1 should have gone with 1st Samuel because it's dealing with the death of Saul and Jonathan. Well, we might look at that chapter first because the rest of the book is the second half of the outline, which is David's kingship, chapters 2 to 24. And as you know from your reading, we have the account of what took place in chapters 28 through 31 of 1 Samuel, how Saul was no longer hearing from the Lord because of his disobedience, no longer hearing the word of the Lord from the prophets or from the Urim and Thummim or by dream or revelation or any other way. And so he went to the fortune teller, the spiritus medium, which was forbidden in scripture. In fact, Saul himself, we're told, put away all of the sorcerers and sorceresses in chapter 28. And Samuel appeared and predicted that he and his sons would die on the battlefield, which they did. Then in the first chapter of 2 Samuel, which, as I say, goes with 1 Samuel, it came to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head, and it was that when he came to David that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. And David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. Now all Israel has been defeated on the mountains, as we know from the previous book, Saul and his son Jonathan and the host of Israel, either killed or put to flight. And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, That the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people also are fallen and dead, and Saul and Jonathan his son are dead also. And David said to the young man that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan his son be dead? And the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me. And I answered, Here am I. And he said, Who art thou? And I said, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me and slay me, for anguish is come upon me because my life is yet whole in me. In other words, he had been wounded unto death by the Philistines, but life is still in him, so he wants uh, him to finish it all. So I stood upon him and slew him because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head, remember he's the king, and the bracelet that was upon his arm and brought them hither unto my Lord. Then David took hold on his clothes and rent them, and likewise all the men that were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until even for Saul and for Jonathan his son and for the people of the Lord and the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. Now what we want to get to is the next few verses. And you see the significance of uh, what happens here. And David said unto the young man that told him, Whence art thou? And he answered, I am the son of a stranger and a Malachite. And David said unto him, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? 
And David called one of the young men and said, Go near and fall upon him, and he smote him that he died. And David said unto him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth has testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. Well, now, if you recall the incidents in uh, 1 Samuel where David had to flee for his life constantly from Saul after the Spirit of the Lord left Saul and came upon David and Samuel anointed David king and God, uh, through Samuel, said he was taking the kingship away from Saul. David constantly had to flee for his life, but twice he caught Saul at a disadvantage in chapters 24 and 26 of 1 Samuel and could have slain him. And his men urged him to do it. One time, you know, Saul was in a cave and the men were hiding, David and his men hiding in the cave. And when they saw what happened, Saul there by himself, they said, now the Lord has delivered him into your hand, David. Why don't you go slay him? But each time in those two cases where he could have done that, what did he say? Anybody? He wouldn't touch the Lord's anointed, even though he had a chance. And so here he will not do that. So it is one thing, you see, for the Lord's anointed to be wrong or it's an error. It's another thing for you to be the one that uproots them or destroys them in this case. As the Lord told one brother who was uh, criticizing another, now it wasn't heresy or anything, he was just wrong about a matter, and the Lord told him not to criticize him because he was his servant. And I remember he said, well, Lord, he's wrong. He said, I know he's wrong, but he's my servant. I'll take care of him. Now, you have to take the whole of everything. Don't try to make that prove any one thing to the exclusion of everything else. Because the same word and the same Lord tells you to admonish and rebuke and to point out error. But we're talking about criticism. You see, that's another thing. Criticism as such. Well, I trust you know what we're talking about. You leave the judgment into the hands of the Lord is the point. David would not take upon himself that uh, awesome responsibility. In fact, he said back in 2 Samuel 24, 26, one of those chapters that the Lord would take care of Saul, which he did. All right, chapters 2 to 24 is the kingship of David, David's kingship. And that's what really the book consists about, and the book should have started here with chapter 2. David, first of all, is made king over Judah. Now, he wasn't accepted as king over all Israel at first, but just the little tribe of Judah. Later on, the elders of all the tribes will come and make him king. But remember, he starts out as a shepherd lad, anointed as king, and not many people, knowing people, are going to stop following a man who stood head and shoulders above the tallest man in Israel, as we were told of Saul, a giant of a man. In every outward way, a person people would follow, they're not going to stop following him, king of Israel, for some little boy that says, I'm king. And so right away, uh, at first, we don't have all Israel following David, but it came to pass after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up? into any of the cities of Judah. And the Lord said unto him, Go up. And David said, Whither shall I go up? And he said, To Hebron. And so David went up thither and his two wives. And the men that were with him did David bring up, every man with his household, and they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. Now Hebron is south of Jerusalem. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And so this is the extent of his kingship at this point. So chapters 2 and 4, David made king over Judah. Now we come to chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, and David is made king over all Israel. Two to four, king of Judah, chapter 5, 1 to 5, David made king over all Israel. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron, and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, thou wast he that leddest us out and broughtest in Israel. And the Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron, 
And King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. Now here he's king over the whole nation. Verse 4, verses 4 and 5 explain the situation. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron he reigned over Judah seven and a half years, and in Jerusalem he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel, which... Uh, is significant. It's seven and a half years that he was just king over one tribe. And again, unless you're familiar with the word, you would have thought when David was king, he was king over the whole nation, but he wasn't for seven and a half years, which is almost two terms of a president. He was over just one tribe. Well, it comes out 40 and a half years, but uh, the Hebrew isn't always as concerned as the Western mind with adding things up on an adding machine. Now, what I said before, it is implying David's a teenager here now, but what I meant was that Israel wasn't about to follow a shepherd boy at first, and they're still thinking of a shepherd boy maybe when he reigns over only one tribe for a while. Then David's conquest of Jerusalem, chapter 5, verse 6 and following. Another thing that comes as news to most Christians is that Israel didn't go into the Promised Land and establish headquarters in Jerusalem. They don't even have it yet. Saul has been king 40 years. David has been king for several years. And just now are they going to take Jerusalem? Verse 6, And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites. You see, Jerusalem belonged to the Canaanite tribe, the Jebusites. The inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither. Thinking David cannot come in hither. They said, uh, The blind and the lame can keep you out, David, out of our fortress. But nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, the same as the city of David. Now, that isn't modern Jerusalem. It isn't a big geographical area. It's just one hill. See if we got a map. What he actually took was just that one hill, and it's called the Mount of Zion. Now, often all Jerusalem is spoken of as Mount Zion. But it's just that part, and it's called the city of David, Mount Zion. Later on, then, it spread out over the four mountains, four hills there. But Jerusalem never was a big city. Jericho was only six acres. But you see, you haven't said anything if you stop there. The six acres of Jericho and probably, well, Jerusalem was bigger than Jericho, and it wasn't big, say, a hundred acres. And I'm just guessing there, but it wasn't big. That would be the fortress. It would be walled and have the towers and the moats and all around it. And then the inhabitants mostly would spread out over the countryside. Then in time of attack, they'd flee into the walled fortress. So Jericho was uh, only six acres of a walled city. But when Israel came up into the plains of Moab, you see all the inhabitants hearing of her exploits coming out of Egypt. When they saw her, they all fled into the city, and there they would live. But anyway, these cities were not big. This, uh, we compare them to Chicago. And, and in fact, Nineveh, remember those of you who were doing Jonah in Hebrew, it says Nineveh was a city of three days' journey, which meant that uh, walking, just normal walking, it would take you three days to encompass it, going around the outside of the wall doesn't mean that you couldn't walk it maybe in a day, but uh, that's just a figure of speech. So it was a big city compared to the cities of that day, to say that it was a city of three days' journey. Or it would take you three days to get through it and see all the important sites. It was just a figure of speech. The cities were not that large. Well, David takes Jerusalem, chapter 5. Then chapter 6, the ark, remember, had been captured, and... Uh, the men of, what was it, Beth Shemesh looked in it, and God slew them for their irreverence. No one was to touch the ark but specified priests, and they couldn't touch it. They had to put staves through rings in the ark and carry it because the ark was God's throne. It was most holy. And now David's going to bring the ark up. 
from where it's been to Judah. And again David gathered together all the chosen men, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people. And verse 2, he said he was going to bring the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, that dwelleth between the cherubims. Now there's at least the fourth reference in the Old Testament that says God actually dwelt between the cherubims. That was his abiding place. He was omnipresent throughout the universe, but he was in a special way enthroned upon Israel in the person of the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Benadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Benadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Benadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark, and David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, harps, psalteries, timbrels, cornets, and cymbals. When they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. He thought it was, you know, in jeopardy. But the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. Now, he should have known better. He was a priest. But you see, they, under Saul's reign, had probably grown lax and careless. That's why the word has to be taught constantly to people. That's why you've got four Gospels that sound in many ways repetitious, is because we must keep reminding the people of God's requirements. Now here's a priest who was presumptuous. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day, and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him, unto the city of David. But David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. He was afraid, you know, he didn't know what would happen next. But this is a part of the price they're paying when, you know, under the judgeship Samuel, the ark was captured by the Philistines, and they were very careless, you know, in the treatment of God's throne. So God is teaching them a lesson. The ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, and the Lord began to bless his house. And when David learned that he had blessed his house, then he went and got the ark again, feeling that everything was all right. Verse 13, It was so when they bare the ark of the Lord and had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. Now, he wasn't just gliding along, slowly dancing in the spirit, but he was <laughs> like a drum major before a band. He was really leading this procession. He danced with all of his might, around and round. Well, <clears throat> somebody said that's Old Testament. <laughs> well, with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we ought to be even more expressive. And let, let the visitors worry about what it's all about. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came to the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart because after all, he's the king and she is his wife. She's the queen. And uh, he was making a spectacle of himself. Well, they set the ark up. David, verse 20, returned to his household. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today. (laughs) (laughs) She's speaking sarcastically, of course. How glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. Well, I imagine you did see more than his ankles when he was jumping around. And that's what she's getting at. And David said to Michael, it was before the Lord which chose me before thy father. (laughs) That put her in her place. (laughs) He chose me instead of your father. And before all his house to appoint me ruler 
over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord, and I will yet be more vile than this, and I will be base in my own sight. And of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. Now, who was right? Verse 23 tells us, Therefore Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child until the day of her death. So either David didn't live with her as a husband any longer, he had other wives anyway, or God caused her to be barren. So you can take your choice, it doesn't say. But anyway, uh, she should not have, uh, have rebuked the king to begin with, rebuked her husband, secondly, and thirdly, rebuked a person who was rejoicing in the Lord. She was wrong on three counts. Three strikes are out. <laughs> chapter 7, God's covenant with David. This is the most important chapter in 2 Samuel. Here we have a messianic prophecy. David wants to build a temple, get the ark of God out of a, the portable tabernacle that it's been in since they left Egypt and build a glorious temple. God tells him that he's a man of war and he doesn't want a man of war building his house. Now God wanted David to be a man of war. That isn't that he's criticizing him, but no one who's been shedding blood can build his house. And he's going to raise up a son after him who will build it. But the prophecy of a son to build the house of God goes beyond Solomon who built it, his son, to the Messiah. And as we often see in prophecy and in scripture, it has a twofold meaning or emphasis. Like in Hosea chapter 11, I believe, chapter 11, verse 1, it says, I've called my son out of Egypt, speaking of Israel. But when Joseph took Jesus fleeing from Herod into Egypt and brought him back at the direction of the angel, Matthew quotes this and said, this fulfilled the scripture I called my son, brought my son out of Egypt. So there was a twofold meaning applying to Israel and Jesus. And so here it applies to Solomon, some of it, but those who know the nature of Messianic prophecy, of course, and Israel herself, of course, knew that this was Messianic, always did. Well, it came to pass that the king sat in his house and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within curtains. He means in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, now this is a prophet speaking, Go do all that's in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. That's the word of the prophet. Can a prophet ever be wrong? Yes, a prophet can be wrong. Prophecy can never be wrong because that's inspired of the Lord. But a prophet is a man. That's why in 1 Corinthians 14 we're told to test the prophets and the prophecies. In 1 Thessalonians 5 we're told to despise not prophesying, to prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Don't despise it, but prove it and hold fast to that which is good. Now, Nathan is just speaking out of his own heart here, because why wouldn't the Lord want a house? And being a prophet didn't change the fact that he didn't say that of the Lord, and he didn't say, thus saith the Lord. You notice that. He just said, for the Lord is with thee. He thought that was a good idea. But it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, go and tell my servant David, I didn't tell you that. <laughs> You see, thus saith the Lord, shalt thou build me a house, a house for me to dwell in, whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. There again, he said, where he was. In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build you not me? the house of cedar. Now therefore so shalt thou say unto my servant David, and now here's the word of the Lord, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheepcote, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. 
And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. See, none of that's happened yet. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. David wants to build the Lord a house. He said, I'm going to make you a house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy loins, and I will establish his kingdom. Now that's the messianic prophecy. See, that Messiah one day will come out of the loins of David, according to the flesh. Romans chapter 1, verse 4. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. See, he's moving beyond the temple and the Davidic kingdom, that is the kingdom of Solomon. And the same thing is said of the Messiah in Luke chapter 1, that he establish his throne, give him the throne of David, and he'll rule over it forever. So the prophecy moves beyond Solomon. Verse 33 of Luke 1 says, He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Speaking of the virgin birth, the Messiah. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. Now, up to that point, it's mainly messianic. Then we move to Solomon. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. As many prophecies are, as I say, they're interwoven. And sometimes you have to wait to their fulfillment to see just what is fully messianic. But there is 2 Samuel 7, the great messianic prophecy of the establishment of the throne of the Messiah and his kingdom, which will be forever. Chapter 7. You should not forget 2 Samuel 7. The chapters 8 to 10 give us an account of David's victories over the enemies of Israel, which we can pass over in this survey. Chapters 11 to 12, David's sin with Bathsheba and the consequences. Now the interesting thing is we see in Old Testament history that Rahab the harlot is an ancestor of the Messiah, according to the first chapter of Matthew. She was the only one in Jericho that had faith, but she was a harlot, and she's an ancestress of the Messiah. We see in the book of Ruth that a Moabitess, not an Israelite, a Moabitess, became an ancestor of David and the Messiah. And in 2 Samuel 7 and following, you find out Solomon, who's the child of an adulterous relationship, becomes the line that God chooses, not the other sons of David, but through Solomon comes the messianic line. And among other things, God is telling us something. See if you can figure out what it is. We've said it many times, that he is dealing with a fallen race, and he didn't choose a lot of men somewhere, women somewhere between men and angels. <clears throat> but he took took those that in his electing love he chose. And some are called harlots, but what were you before you were saved? You were a spiritual harlot, adulterer. We were all in the same category as Rahab and so on. I mean, it's a lesson we don't need to forget. We sometimes think it's the other way, but the Bible paints some pictures and warts and all. David's sin is not obscured at all, but it's set forth in two chapters here. It came to pass after the year was expired when times when kings go forth to battle. They had a time, you see. But David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon, besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. It came to pass in the evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked up on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired of the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba? 
the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, Uriah the Hittite's a very important man in David's military force, as we'll see later. So he was no just some little old soldier, but he was one of the leading men. David had 37 mighty men, and he was one of them. Yeah. Yeah, he was a Hittite. The Hittites were in Palestine, you remember, before the Israelites got there. Well, we know the story that uh, David <laughs> committed adultery with her and then she found out she was with child and Uriah off to battle. He couldn't be the father of it, so he devised the plan to get Uriah back to give him a leave. <laughs> and Uriah didn't know what it was all about, but the Lord was in it to bring David's sin to light and Uriah wouldn't go home. He slept at David's door. <laughs> So uh, David couldn't figure out, he knew if he went home, he, could, he would just figure it's his child. But uh, the Lord was in it, and so David uh, didn't know what to do next, so he wrote, verse 14, it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab, and he uh, even sent it by the hand of Uriah. <laughs> I don't know what he'd done if he'd opened the letter, but uh, said, put him in the foremost front of the battle and then run off and leave him and that's what happened and Uriah was killed uh, as we pointed out in biblical theology that not everything David wrote was inspired <laughs> you see you must keep a healthy conservative view of scripture and of prophets and prophecy but we need to see, that's why we study the word, that Nathan said something out of his own heart. Good, it sounded good. All of us would have said amen with him. So we're not blaming Nathan. But it was not the Lord's will. There's something bigger than a prophet's word or faith. And it's the word of the Lord and the will of the Lord. And uh, as I told a brother recently that I know a prophet and I feel he's an apostle. I told him that. It doesn't matter who it is. Uh, most of you wouldn't know him if I told you. Maybe none of you. But I pointed out to him. He said he never speaks anything that isn't uh, from the Lord. I said, yes, brother, but we must distinguish when you're speaking, thus saith the Lord, and when, and I named him when John Smith is speaking, assuming his name's John Smith. And he'd never thought of that. He said, yes, that's right. Because I know of cases where he's been wrong when he was not speaking of the Lord. I know of a case when he said it was thus saith the Lord when he was wrong. And later he changed it because it was out of his own heart. So this is why we judge prophecy, 1 Corinthians 14. I talked to people last week right here. It said, well, uh, this sister prophesies. Well, I said there are two sources of prophecy. You know, how could it not be of the Lord because she says, thus saith the Lord. I, I don't mean to criticize the people who told me that, but just because a person that says, thus saith the Lord, doesn't mean it's from the Lord. You can say that. You can go down the steps saying that. You can say it all the way home. That doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't mean it's the Lord. To me, that's obvious, that we have to see if it's in harmony with the Word. And there are a lot of tests of prophecy. And we've got tapes, I'm sure, on how to test prophecy. But here is scripture. Here is, uh, in scripture, a writing of David that's not inspired. Scripture is inspired. And that's all the Bible says. All scripture is God-breathed. It doesn't say that David was inspired all the time when he spoke, or Peter. Peter spoke things that weren't inspired when he said to Jesus that you don't have to go to the cross, Jesus said, that's from the devil. That's in Matthew 16. Get thee behind me, Satan. But that's no low view of Scripture. That's a high view of Scripture. All Scripture is God-breathed. Well, he sent this letter. We know the consequences. In chapter 12, God sends Nathan the prophet to David. He came unto him, and David doesn't know that he knows he says there were two men in a city, one rich and the other poor. He's giving him a little parable. David doesn't know it's a parable yet. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. This is David. The poor man, who's Uriah, of course, 
had nothing save one little ewe lamb, who was Bathsheba, which he had brought which he had bought and nourished up, and he grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was given to him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock, of his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring man that was coming to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. <laughs> he wasn't inspired there either, was he? <laughs> and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he's done this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. <laughs> Some of the most awesome words in Scripture. Hebrew doesn't use verbs in the present tense, just three words. Thou, the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, I gave thee thy master's house, thy master's wives to thy bosom, I gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have moreover given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, thou hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Then he pronounces a threefold judgment upon David. First of all, verse 10, that the sword shall never depart from thine house. And it didn't. His favorite son, Absalom, rebelled against him. David knew nothing but misery from... You see, the saints of God cannot sin with impunity. You can't sin against the light. There's an easy sermon right here in chapter 12 for anybody. They could get a sermon out of chapter 12. Just because you're a Christian or because you're a child of God doesn't mean you can sin with impunity. In fact, the chastisement will be the harsher upon you. So <clears throat> this is something he could never pray about or exercise faith about. From, from this point on, he'll know nothing but division in his own house. The second judgment, thus saith the Lord, I will raise up evil out of thee, out of thine own house. Well, that was... Uh, Absalom there, but the sword was the tr trouble, division in his house, and here would be uh, trouble right out of his own house, Absalom. And then verse 14, the third aspect, because thou hast done this thing, howbeit because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born in thee shall surely die. So the threefold judgment upon the house. And of course we know David fasted, mourned. The Lord allowed the sickness to come upon the child. He died. It's quite a penalty to pay. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 that he that sins against his body, him the Lord will destroy. So a Christian, he says, the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if you commit sin in the flesh, he said he'll destroy you. That's something to keep in mind. A number of Christians die prematurely because they forget that. They think a little affair on the side, nobody will know about it. They repent of it. And then say, I've got faith. And uh, they end up dying of some disease, and God doesn't always show you why. That's some of those so-called exceptions sometimes. That if you knew all of the situation not implying that's always the reason, but that's some of the time. We come to chapters 13 through 19, verse 8, Absalom's rebellion. David's favorite son rebels. That's quite a penalty to pay. Think of your own house, where if you sin against the Lord, this would be one of the judgments, that your favorite son or daughter would become a rebel. There's some places that faith won't work, friends, something bigger than faith, and that's the will of God. You've got to keep that in mind. Faith won't do anything. I hope our enemies, the enemies of faith, hear us say that. We say it frequently enough. Some things faith won't do. And that has nothing to do with the message of faith concerning God's promises. But you cannot sin against the light and then say, well, I made a mistake, and so on and so forth. 
and then, then start walking by faith in every area. There may be some areas God closes to you from then on. This is a serious thing to sin against the light. David, David of all people. Remember what God said here. He said, because by this sin you've given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. And they're just all around us out there. We can forgive you and God can forgive you, but you give occasion to our enemies to blaspheme. Say, well, we told you there was nothing to that charismatic experience. Look what he or she got mixed up in. Everybody's watching you, including the devil. Somebody had a question? What was the chapter, Absalom's Rebellion, chapter 13 through 19, and verse 8. Well, you know the account from reading it. Absalom has a sister named Tamar. And remember, David has several wives, so there'd be half-sisters and half-brothers stepsisters, stepbrothers, and that sort of thing, going in many of the genealogies of the Old Testament. And so Absalom has a sister named Tamar, and Ammon, one of David's sons, rapes her and then despises her. He loved her at first, raped her, then despises her. And Absalom waits his chance and kills Ammon, and then he has to escape for his life. And eventually David allows him to come back but he's not permitted, because he's untrustworthy, to go anywhere he pleases. And so Absalom begins to scheme in chapter 15 and prepares him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. And what he's doing here is going to start winning the allegiance of the Israelites over to him, the king's son. And Absalom rose early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom would stop him, you see, and call him to him and say, Of what city art thou? And he said, The servant of one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said, See, thy matters are good and right. He would tell everyone they had a good cause, you know, and cause for complaint. But there's no man, a deputy of the king, to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, Oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand, took him, and kissed him. He was what we call a successful politician. Politicians <laughs> kiss the babies, but he kissed everybody that came. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel, and it came, that came to the king for judgment, so Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. See, it doesn't take long for a thing like that to get around. And so he gets permission, he lies to David, said he had vowed a vow, and he has to go down to Hebron. David permits him to go. Verse 13, there came a messenger to David saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. Absalom calls a conspiracy, and uh, the people of the land began to follow him. And David said to all his servants that were with him, Arise and let us flee, for we shall not escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly, and bring evil upon us, and smite the city with the edge of the sword. And so Absalom uh, usurps the throne, becomes a king, and rules for a while, and they have battles, David and his men that fled with him, with the Israelites. David finds himself fighting against his own nation. One day the battle goes against Absalom, as God could not allow David to be utterly defeated. See, this is a part of the judgment. The sword will not depart from your house. Evil will rise up from within your house. But it can only go so far. And Absalom and his forces are defeated. Verse 9 of chapter 18, Absalom himself flees. He met the servants of David. And he was riding upon a mule, and the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak. And his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth, and the mule which was under him went away. There he was hanging by the hair of his head. In one of the uh, passages here, it says that Absalom had a full head of hair, <laughs> a huge head of hair, and uh, he didn't cut it. And when he did cut it, uh, it got so long, you know, he'd cut it and it told how much it weighed. 
But here he's caught by the hair of his head. Okay. <clears throat> Does he have to be shaved or just cut it short? Well, he wouldn't shave it. He would just cut it. He was too proud of it. That's what the passage implies. So it was told Joab that he was hanged in an oak by the hair of his head. So Joab uh, finds him. And verse 14 has three darts. These are probably small swords. Three darts in his hand, and he thrusts them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. Now Joab, of course, is David's general. David laments over his death. That was his favorite son. But at his death, then David is restored. So David's restoration, chapter 19 through chapter 21. Many, many details. You ought to read 2 Samuel carefully because it is filled with significant biblical information upon which much of the uh, scripture is built, you see, upon the reign of David. So you need to know about 2 Samuel and David's reign. Song of David and his last words, chapter 22 through 23, 7. Song of David and David's last words. Verse 2 of 22, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, the God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield. Chapter 23, the last words of David. These are the last words of David. Verse 2 shows these were inspired. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. Then chapter 23, 8 and following, gives a list of the exploits, the names and exploits of David's mighty men. Now these men had supernatural strength. They were all like Samson. The Spirit of the Lord was upon them, 37 of them. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. See, David couldn't have won the battles he did without brilliant generals and extremely courageous and strong men. First one was a, a dino, the Esnite. What did he do? He lift up his spear against 800 and slew them at one time. Wow, he's right in the same class as Samson, you see. He had 37 men like this. After him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo. <laughs> so uh, when you call somebody an old Dodo, I, uh, I don't know what that's supposed to mean today. I'll have to look that up in the Hebrew. After him was Eliezer. He was one of the three mighty men with David. Now later on I'll speak of three others and three others, but the first three are the greatest three. These are the three that went with David everywhere he went. They defied the Philistines and were gathered together to battle. Eliezer, he arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto the sword. They had to pry his hand loose from the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to spoil. I mean, that's all they had to do is gather up the spoil. See, these men would have to be supernaturally protected, too. See, they were just like a windmill. they just whirl around with their sword or spear and, and uh, with supernatural strength, and no one could get close to them. After him was Shema. What did he do? The Philistines were gathered together in a troop where it was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines, but he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines and the Lord wrought a great victory. And three of the thirty chief went down and came to David in the harvest time. This is another three, I imagine. That's when David was fleeing from Saul and he was at Adullam. See, this is looking back into 1 Samuel. And David was then in the hold, and the garrison of the Philistines were then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out 
of course, is an offering to the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. And another one is Abishai. What did he do? He lifted up his spear against three hundred and slew them. He had the name among the three. Was he not most honorable of three? Therefore he was their captain. Howbeit he attained not to the first three, that is, the first three that we mentioned that were with David. This is another group of three. They seem to have gone in threes. And another was Benaiah, verse 20. What did he do? Well, he had done many acts, among which he slew two lion-like men of Moab. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in the time of snow. And he slew an Egyptian, a goodly man. And the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but he went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and had the name among the three mighty men. See, that's another group of three. He was more honorable than the thirty, but he attained not to the first three. And David set him over his guard. And then he names all the others. Azahel, and right on down to verse 39. Who's the last of the mighty men? Well, look who we run into, Uriah the Hittite. So he wasn't, as I said before, just some insignificant Israelite. Not that that would make David sin any less, but this is one of David's palace guard, one of his favorite men that he committed this sin against. One of the 37 of the mighty men of David. Uriah the Hittite. Chapter 24 is a very significant chapter. It's the numbering of Israel. The numbering of Israel. They were forbidden to number, remember? God said you can't number yourselves lest you trust in your strength, own strength. But see, the Lord had an occasion against Israel because of her sin, and so he would often allow a, a tempting spirit or something as First Chronicles, which records this, says the devil tempted David, you see. But remember, the Old Testament knows, the Old Testament saint knows that the devil can't do anything unless God permits it. That's Job 1 and 2, for example. And it's also Zechariah 3. And they're not always concerned, like the Western mind, with neat theological finesse, where you have to explain everything you mean by what you say. And so if they say God moved David to number Israel, then... They know nothing can happen unless God either caused it or permitted it. So don't, as some do, say, hey, do you know what First Chronicles says about us? Sure do. I've already told you. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them, go number Israel and Judah. For the king said to Joab, the captain of the host, which was with him, go now through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and number the people that I may know the number thereof. He means the military men, his army. And Joab said to the king, Now the Lord thy God add to the people, how many soever they be a hundredfold, and that the eyes of my lord the king may see it. But why does my lord the king delight in this thing, notwithstanding the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the captain of the host? And Joab and the captain of the host went from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. And then it gives the numbering. So I say which was forbidden to do. Verse 10, David's heart smote him after he had numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I've sinned greatly in this that I've done, and now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I've done very foolishly. For when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose the one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come upon thee in thy land? That's one. Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? That's the second choice. Or that there be three days pestilence in the land. Now advise and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. And David said to Gad, I am in a great strait. I can see why. That's not much of a choice. <laughs> he said, let us fall into the hand of the Lord for his mercies are great let me not fall in the hand of man. Would you have had that much wisdom? God gave him three choices. Two of them, he would be at the mercy of his enemies. 
One of them, he'd be at the mercy of God. The pestilence, because that would be supernatural. So he said, I know that uh, God can show mercy, but my enemies wouldn't. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed, and there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba, 70,000. You see, but we're already told that the Israelites were in gross sin. That's why God uh, is allowing this numbering so that he can punish them. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil. We've already explained that that means he turned from the calamity that he had decreed and said to the angel that destroyed the people, it is enough. Stay now thine hand of the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. And David spake unto the Lord when he saw the angel that smote the people and said, Lo, I have sinned, I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Aruna. And David, according to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. And Aruna looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Aruna went out and bowed himself before the king to the face of the ground. Aruna said, Wherefore is my lord the king come? To his servant David said to buy the threshing floor of thee to build an altar unto the Lord that the plague may be stayed from the people. Aruna said to the king, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seemeth good unto him. And behold, here be oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing instruments and other instruments of oxen for wood. All these things did Aruna. As a king given to the king, and Aruna said to the king, The Lord thy God accept thee. See, that was the Near Eastern custom, as I've told you before. They uh, always offer to you free. They really don't expect you to do that. That isn't why they offer. But David, of course, being a part of that culture, didn't take it. He was going to pay for it. Remember the coin I said that I wanted to buy, and I offered a certain price, and he just threw it on the counter in Jerusalem and said, take it free. I don't know what would have happened if I'd have taken it free. <clears throat> he, that's just the way they do business. But the king said to Aruna, nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor of the oxen for fifty shekels of silver. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated from the land. The plague was stayed from Israel. Now the significance of reading all of that is where that altar was, was a great stone. The stone, they would have a flat stone on top of a hill where they would thresh and winnow the wheat and all and blow the chaff away in the wind. Here's a huge stone here on the top of Mount Zion. See, he's in Jerusalem where the plague was stayed. And where that rock is is where the altar stood and the temple was right behind it when Solomon built it. So what he's buying here is the site for the altar, great altar of God, which will be before the temple.